Okay. Um, all right, let me, uh, give me one second here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, since we've got so many folks on today, um, what I'm gonna ask you guys to do, um, we certainly uh, are willing to answer questions. Um, what I'll ask you to do is if you have a question, put it in the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat during the presentation. Um, if it's uh, something that I can handle right there, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it and uh, I may ask you to come off mute if, if uh, we need a little more explanation of what your question is about. Um, but basically, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, the electric revolution um, or the evolution of the electric car in, in the United States. Um, and this is going to be a brief history, and we'll talk a little bit about where we've been, and we'll talk a little bit about where we're going. Um, thanks to Rick Price um, for sponsoring this. Uh, Rick's doing an amazing job uh, out, out with the uh, Pittsburgh Clean Cities group. Um, and uh, the uh, Owners Club of Pennsylvania is very uh, happy to be able to partner with him on these uh, presentations. So without further ado, we'll get started. So we're going to cover a brief history. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we're going to cover a brief history of electric car today. Um, believe it or not, uh, the first electric car came into existence in 1832. Um, a gentleman by the name of Robert Anderson um, developed it, and it was an interesting vehicle, not very practical at the time. Uh, one of the issues uh, was uh, that uh, battery technology really wasn't where it is today. And this vehicle actually had disposable batteries. So basically, you charged them once, you could drive. When they were done, you needed to replace them. Not very practical um, for an everyday vehicle. But finally, in 1891, uh, William Morrison of uh, Iowa, also, by the way, the man who invented the uh, cotton candy machine, uh, all came out with the first successful consumer electric car. And uh, William Morrison's car actually used rechargeable batteries, could travel at about 14 to 15 miles an hour, um, and uh, was, was selling, the sales price was somewhere around 16 or $1,700, which at the time was quite a bit of money. But one of the reasons that the electric car was so popular at that point was because cars with gasoline engines could only be started with a crank. And one of the things that uh, uh, women did not appreciate was the idea of having to go out and hit a heavy crank to start their cars. With the electric car, they could get in, there were no gears to change. Um, basically, they pressed a button and they could drive. And most of the driving, since roads were really not um, in great shape, so most of the driving was really done within the towns. For that, um, these vehicles were actually great for that. As you can see here, the, the Fritchley Electric um, actually had a 100 mile range. Again, traveling at 14, 15, maybe 20 miles an hour, um, but that was more than adequate if you were trying to move around a local city or town. Okay. So um, during this time, uh, electric vehicles ruled. Let me let you go. My doctor just walked in. Yeah, um, I'll ask everybody to stay on mute so we don't get a, a lot of bad. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so in 1901, Edison actually um, made dramatic improvements in battery technology. He made rechargeable batteries practical. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, 
not shortly thereafter, he was working with a, a young gentleman uh, named Henry Ford. Um, and Ford was actually very interested in Edison's battery technology. So between 1901 and 1912, 30% of all cars were electric. Uh, they really, you know, were the mainstream. And in 1901 also, Ferdinand Porsche developed the first hybrid car, which was a gas and electric vehicle. So here was Porsche's first hybrid. Right. Now, as you notice, um, doesn't look much like any Porsche that you've seen today, but it was very innovative in the fact that it did was able to combine um, electric use for local use and gasoline use uh, if, if you needed to leave the town and uh, take a trip somewhere else. So what happened? Everything was going so well. Well, in 1908, Henry Ford began mass producing his Model T and he invented the electric starter. All of a sudden, women didn't have to worry about cranking these cars anymore and could get in and press a foot pedal and be able to start the vehicle. In addition to that, Henry Ford's Model T was selling for $650 versus the $1,700 that it cost to get an electric car at this point. Around 1920, between cheap gas, um, better roads, because now all of a sudden the roads were improving and you could drive from town to town um, and have a reasonable road to do that. Um, so gas stations began to pop up. And finally, by 1935, electric cars were pretty much gone. But they weren't gone for good. So the rising cost of fossil fuels in the 70s and 90s was a real wake up call for all of us. Um, for those of us old enough to remember, um, you can think back uh, to the gas lines and gas rationing and being able to gas on every other day. Um, those issues you know, started to come to a head and we started to realize that fossil fuels are a finite resource. We recognize now that climate change is real and it is damaging to the planet. We understand that air quality affects everyone's health. So all this, along with massive improvements in battery technology, basically brought interest in electric cars back uh, as, as a choice for transportation. Oops. So in 1996, General Motors came out with the EV1 and battery electric vehicles made a comeback. And the EV1 was actually quite a car. And GM did an impressive job considering that uh, electric vehicles hadn't been around in so long. Um, and this became the first car to be mass produced in the modern era. So GM put 1,117 of these cars in service. Uh, they were lease only. They had an amazingly positive response from their owners. Uh, but GM wouldn't let you buy them. They call it a pilot program. The Gen 1 cars uh, had lead acid batteries in a range of about 78 miles. The Gen 2 cars actually moved to a nickel metal hydride battery, which doubled the range of the vehicles to 160 miles. Now, the nickel metal hydride batteries had great potential. Um, they could charge faster than lead acid. They held the charge better. Uh, they were lighter by a couple of hundred pounds. Um, they had a lot of promise to them. And uh, had they been allowed to continue in use, uh, they probably would have been able to push the electric car further than it did in, in the EV1. But then came the big oil companies. A fairly large oil company by the name of Chevron bought the patent for nickel metal hydride batteries and refused to allow them to be used for transportation. Uh, that patent expired in 2018. But until then, Chevron basically controlled the use of nickel metal hydride batteries uh, in the US. So claiming issues with the patent, uh, Chevron actually told General Motors, you can't use our batteries in your cars anymore. Um, 
and low consumer interest, GM took back all the leased cars and unfortunately decided to crush them. And that's pretty much what happened to the EV1. And believe me, um, owners were livid about this. Um, some were actually hiding their cars so that GM couldn't find them to, re to repossess them for the lease. Um, 60 owners actually sent uh, $2,000 checks to General Motors um, saying that they would extend the lease and take full liability for the vehicle themselves. But uh, GM wanted nothing to do with that. Um, so these cars disappeared and Chevron basically won the day. But that brings us to where we are. So in 2008, uh, Elon Musk and Tesla introduced the electric roadster. 2010, Nissan introduces the Leaf. Now, one of the things that made this possible was the introduction of lithium ion batteries. Um, first of all, to, again, 2018 was the end of Chevron's uh, um, block on nickel metal hydride, but the lithium ion batteries opened the doors to electric vehicles again. 2011, the Chevy Volt, which was a very interesting car um, because it basically, while being a hybrid, it wasn't really a true hybrid. The, the Chevy Volt was actually an electric car with a gasoline generator. So the generator really had no direct connection to the drive wheels in the car, um, but instead was used to recharge the batteries, and then the batteries actually were used to um, move the vehicle. 2012, the Tesla Model S goes into production. 16, the Model X goes into production. Also in 16, the Chevy Bolt, which is the first all-electric car from Chevrolet since, and the first all-electric car from General Motors since the EV1 was introduced. The Model 3 goes into production in 2018. The YN20, and before we know it, in 21, Tesla delivered over 930,000 cars. Um, the expectation is somewhere in the 1.7 million range for, for, for Tesla production this year. So all of a sudden, the electric car has made a huge comeback um, and is, uh, in the, it is poised to be able to become the predominant means of transportation. So let's talk about how all this works. Electric cars are taking over. They're getting nines in the quarter mile. Oh my God, but how do they work? The electric car might seem like a relatively new fad hitting the car world, but they're actually a lot older than you might think. In 1834, Professor Sabrandus Stratching of Groningen, Netherlands, and his assistant Christopher Becker created a small scale electrical car powered by non rechargeable primary cell. William Morrison of Des Moines, Iowa, built the first successful electric automobile in the United States in 1891. And by 1897, most of New York's taxis were electric powered. It's crazy. Before we get into how electric cars work, we need to understand how a battery works. You can't store electricity, but you can store electrical energy in the chemicals inside a battery. There are three main components of a battery. Two terminals or nodes made of different chemicals, typically metals, the anode and the cathode. And then there's the electrolyte, which separates these terminals. The electrolyte is there to put the different chemicals of the anode and the cathode into contact with one another in a way that the chemical potential can equilibrate. During a discharge of electricity, the chemical on the anode releases electrons to the negative terminal and ions in the electrolyte. Meanwhile, at the positive terminal, the cathode accepts electrons, completing the circuit for the flow of electrons, converting stored chemical energy into useful electrical energy. And that's what generates an electric current. It took a while before we'd improved battery technology enough that we could power a vehicle to travel practical distances. But guess what? We got them! The batteries in most hybrids and most fully electric cars, I'm looking at you, Elon, look like this. 
This metal case holds a long spiral comprising three thin sheets pressed together. Inside the case, these sheets are submerged in an organic solvent, often ether, that acts as the electrolyte. The separator is a very thin sheet of microperforated plastic. The positive electrode is made of lithium cobalt oxide. The negative electrode is made of carbon. When the battery charges, ions of lithium move through the electrolyte from the positive electrode to the negative electrode and attach to the carbon. During discharge, the lithium ions move back to the lithium cobalt oxide from the carbon. It's the same principle as any other battery, but because these batteries can store so much electric energy as chemical energy, lithium ion batteries are what help electric cars make the leap from novelty to reality. And the great thing about lithium ion batteries is that they can recharge over and over and over and over and over. The lithium ion batteries in the Tesla battery pack are actually super similar to the rechargeable batteries that you'd find at the store. They're also commonly used in vapes. Each cell contains 4.2 volts and about 30 amps. What does that mean? Electricity flows like water, so let's think of where we store water. In a reservoir. Here's a reservoir behind a dam. The water back here is like the voltage in a battery. It's like a stored charge. If we let some water out of the dam, we can measure the rate of flow. In a battery, this current's measured in amps. On a battery, amps measures capacity. That's pretty much how quickly the energy can flow out of it. If I put more water in the dam, the flow can still be limited. So a greater voltage can be limited by amperage. Also, if we increase the flow without increasing the charge, we run out of juice before it does us any good. In a battery cell, amps measures capacity, basically how well the current can flow. Wiring cells together can increase either voltage, the energy stored, or amperage, the flow of current, or both. If I wire a battery in series, I'm doubling the voltage while maintaining the same capacity rate. If I wire a battery in parallel, I'm doubling the amperage while maintaining the same voltage rating. 7,104 cells in the Tesla Model S battery are wired in a combination of parallel and series over 16 modules to increase both voltage and amperage to 1,500 amps and 400 volts. That's a lot of juice! But how do they move? Back in the early 1800s, everybody was anybody was screwing around with electricity and the resulting currents. So it wasn't long before people realized wrapping wires and sending currents through them generated magnetic fields. If you've ever tried to touch two magnets north ends, well, you know that there's a tangible physical force that magnetic fields can generate. Electric motors use this force to actuate motion. The Tesla Model S uses a motor first invented by Nikola Tesla about a hundred years ago. The induction motor. The motor consists of two parts, the rotor and the stator. The rotor is a series of conduction bars short-circuited by end rings. A three-phase AC pulse is given to the stator. This alternating current produces a four-pole rotating magnetic field, or RMF. The electricity running through the stator induces current on the rotor's metal bars. Just like the magnets can attract or repel to cause movement, the rotating field of the stator causes movement in the now charged rotor. In an induction motor, the rotor is always just behind the RMF. The speed of the rotor is determined by the frequency of the AC current through the stator. When you hit the gas, you're actually increasing the frequency of current. An inverter switches the direct current from the batteries to an alternating current to drive the motor. It sits right by the motor and it's got all the guts to determine the frequency of current, which determines the speed of the rotor and the amplitude of the current, which affects the power output of the rotor. And that's determined by a variable frequency drive attached to all of this right here. The only points of contact 
are the bearings that keep the rotor in place. There's no other touching going on between the rotor and the stator, so it's hard for them to wear out. And unlike a conventional engine whose usable torque welds only within a limited rev range, usually under 8,000 RPM, the Tesla motor can effectively produce force to a rev range up to 18,000 RPM, so there's no need for shifting or torque converter. Also, unlike conventional engines that convert up and down or side to side motion of the pistons to rotational movement, the induction motor produces exclusively rotational force, which means almost all of that can be turned to forward motion when the wheels hit the road. Traditional internal combustion engines can weigh up to 600 pounds. A Tesla Model S motor can generate 362 horsepower and only weighs about 70 pounds. But you got to remember they're getting all that juice for those horses from a 1,200 pound battery. Even with that massive battery, the Tesla Model S's 443 pound-feet of torque and 416 horsepower allows you to get to 60 miles an hour in 4.2 seconds in a sedan. Tesla says their biggest concern discharging all that energy and spinning the rotors at 18,000 RPM is heat. So most of the components, including the motor, the frequency drive and the battery are liquid cooled, so they don't overheat. Oh, and here's the other thing about the Tesla. The induction motor, when it's not producing movement at the wheels, can be spun by the wheels, which makes it run like the alternator in your car, recharging the lithium ion battery. So more motors means, yes, you're getting more power through the wheel, but it also means more charge coming back to the battery when you're rolling and braking. It's responsible. But making these cars and charging them will also cause emissions. There's no such thing as totally green cars. Well, you're right. There is no such thing as a truly carbon neutral car, but even factoring the carbon created manufacturing the cars, Electric cars have a significantly smaller carbon footprint than gasoline-powered cars, and the process is getting more efficient all the time. If you want to help Donut make more great content, check out Brilliant.org. They sponsor. Okay, so there we have uh, what, what I consider a really excellent overview of exactly how the battery technology works. So let's talk about uh, um, what's slowing us down in uh, being able to do the uh, changeover to electric vehicles. So the first thing we need to look at is, you know, what are the perceived weaknesses of electric cars? And there are perceived weaknesses. Um, and that doesn't mean that they are real, but they are perceived. Um, so range, they can't go far between charges. Endurance, it takes a long time to charge them. Speed, they're not very fast and price, they are expensive. So let's take a look at each one of these. So first, range is not an issue with an electric vehicle any longer. I mean, if we look at uh, ICE cars, um, when I say an ICE car, I'm referring to internal combustion engines. Um, typical ICE car with a tank of gas is gonna get somewhere between 350 and 400 miles, mid-range car, maybe 375 to 425. Um, if we take a look at what's out there these days, um, a Tesla Model S 100 now is rated at 405 miles of range. The Lucid Air actually as much as 500 miles of range and a Tesla Model 3 at, at 370 miles of range. So none of this really is an issue because the average daily commute is about 30 miles. So for everyday use, you don't need a tremendous amount of range to be able to um, basically accommodate what most people do on a daily basis. Of course, range for all of these vehicles depends on how you drive them, how fast you drive them, um, and also other factors like terrain and weather. Um, everybody knows that during uh, the winter time here in Pennsylvania, um, you know, we expect roughly a 20 to 30 percent reduction in range based on the climate on the temperature. Uh, so endurance, why is it not an issue? Well, the key factor is that most electric cars get charged at home at night. So basically, you get up in the morning, you get in your vehicle with a full tank. 
It's great for the electric grid because most of this is off-peak charging when the grid is, has got the least amount of use. So what do we do about lengthy road trips? Well, we've got a number of alternatives. Um, if you guys go out and take a look at this, and there's an app and a web, website called plugshare.com that shows you all the public and private charging stations. Um, as of today, there are over 30,000 Tesla supercharging stations globally. And Electrify America will have 800 charging locations with 3,500 stations installed in the US by the end of 2022. So if we take a look at what that map looks like, that's the plug share network in the United States. Each one of those locations is a potential place where you can plug your electric car in and charge it. If we just look at the Tesla network, this is the Tesla network in the United States. So charging is certainly not an issue. Now, speed is also not an issue. Obviously, you should always obey traffic laws. You should never drive unsafely. But some people do take their cars to the racetrack. Um, so we've been able to look at how electric cars sit up in comparison to, to ICE cars. So the fastest zero to 60 acceleration uh, by an ICE car was in the 2014 Porsche Spider at 2.2 seconds. Um, the Tesla Model S Plaid, which is a full-size sedan as compared to the Porsche, did that in 21 in 2.1 seconds. <clears throat> the fastest quarter mile by a street legal vehicle um, was with a Bugatti at 9.7 seconds. And now the 21 Tesla model Plaid has actually broken that record with a quarter mile of 8.9 seconds. So speed is certainly not an issue for these cars. Well, why is price an issue? Because price is always an issue. First of all, electric cars have a large battery and the battery gets bigger as you increase range and speed. Bigger the battery, the higher the price tag. Tesla's, Tesla's batteries contain over 7,000 battery cells. So battery, batteries that power most of our devices today, they're all very expensive. Um, estimates today are that the battery is about 33% of the cost of a Tesla. Now, while that sounds fairly large, if we look back at 2012, when Tesla first introduced the Model S, um, it was estimated that the battery cost was more than 55% of the car. So what's been happening over the last 10 to 12 years is that battery costs are coming down dramatically. In addition to that, the overall cost of ownership for an electric vehicle, when you count maintenance and fuel, is roughly half of what it costs to maintain an internal combustion vehicle. Also, thanks to operations like Tesla's Gigafactory, Tesla battery costs are now below $100 per kilowatt hour. Um, they were as much as $150 um, or $160 back in, in 2012. Um, it's a 50% reduction in cost in the last 10 years, but that's expected to continue. Um, and, and we're hearing numbers like $60 or $70 a kilowatt hour um, sometime this year. As those costs come down, the cost of those vehicles comes down. Tesla's Gigafactory in uh, California is a perfect example of that. It's going to be the largest building in the world by footprint um, when it's all in operation. Um, only a, a, a small section actually is now being operated in there. Um, but it's also reducing battery costs dramatically. OK, so one of the other things that always comes up and I've gotten into a few debates with this, uh, um, with a number of folks about electric cars, um, which is basically pollution. Is the smokestack better than the, than the tailpipe? Ultimately, it is. In 2015, a report from the Union of Concerned Scientists pointed out, over their lifetime, battery electric vehicles produced far less global warming pollution than gasoline, and they're getting cleaner, and that's the key is that, yeah, we're not all the way there yet. Manufacturing these cars still takes a, a large amount of energy, though that is improving all the time 
And it also depends on the size of the, of the battery in the vehicles that we're talking about. So basically they make up for this higher manufacturing emissions within 18 months of driving the car. And if you have a shorter range vehicle, for example, like the Nissan Leaf, within six months, you, you've already uh, um, basically offset the additional manufacturing overhead um, involved in building an electric car. So by the end of their lives, gas powered cars spew out twice as much global pollution as an equivalent electric car, especially when you factor in fuel and manufacturing. Disposing of the vehicles is probably about even. They both have a, about less than a ton of, uh, of material that gets disposed of. So how far do they really go? As we talked about, you've got a variable amount of ranges here. Um, the Nissan Leaf, when it first was introduced, was about 70 or 80 miles of range. Now is, that, is up to 150 miles of range. If you think about it, with the average daily commute being 30 miles, 149 mile Nissan Leaf would satisfy probably 70 or 80% of most American needs for, for commuting. Okay, so where are we going from here? Well, we talked about the fact that Tesla's uh, gonna be delivering 1.7 million cars this year, but the other thing, there's low hanging fruit out here. When we look at sources of, of pollution, commercial semi-trucks is obviously um, a, a sweet target because <clears throat> these trucks produce a tremendous amount of air pollution um, and greenhouse gases. Um, okay. Um, pickup trucks. In the United States, pickup trucks are still the number one selling vehicles we need to take a look at how to make those electric and, I'm, and the manufacturers are now stepping up to, to being able to do that. School buses, again, now we're talking about local transportation, um, which is really the sweet spot for an electric vehicle. Public transportation, public buses um, are another sweet spot for electric transportation. Delivery vans, that last mile of the, as we call it in, in delivery services, um, is easily accommodated with an electric vehicle. So we take a look at that and Tesla semi-truck hopefully will be out uh, sometime next year, perhaps. Um, we're still kind of waiting on that. It looks pretty cool. <laughs> There's also companies like Hillian out there. Um, excuse me one second. Hillian um, recognizes the fact that trucking companies um, have a huge investment in their existing fleet. And you can't just throw that away. So what Hillian has done is they're focused on doing conversions of the existing fleets and converting fossil fuel vehicles over to electric. Um, in addition to that, they're also involved with hydrogen conversions. They do a lot of very cool stuff. So recognizing that most trucking companies aren't gonna to wanna to throw their tractor trailers out, this is another way to get on board with that. Um, let's see, we have a question in the chat. Hang on one second. Um, how can Tesla compete on new car price with, with the many new competitive models being introduced since they are no longer eligible for federal rebates. By the way, excellent. Th thank you, Sam. Um, actually, that's a great question. And quite frankly, Tesla has not been eligible for federal rebates, um, I think since 2016. Um, they blew through that fairly quickly. So they've never really been, a been competing with the federal rebate. Uh, 2018, thanks, Dave. <laughs> I knew it was around there. Um, so the, the federal rebate really has had no effect. Um, look, Tesla competes based on quality um, and durability, and their cars have a proven track record of doing that. In addition, um, you know, Tesla's prices keep rising. Right now, if you ordered a Tesla Model Y today, you'd be waiting until roughly February of 2023 to get your car. 
So therefore, when the demand is that high, Tesla has no incentive to drop the prices. Um, if there was more competition out there, I have no doubt that they would find a way to uh, compete on that level if they needed to. Okay, hang on. Uh, let's see here. A um, couple other questions popping up. Yes, Volvo has, yeah, I'm not trying to zoom in on any one manufacturer. Um, there's just about every manufacturer out there is starting to move in this direction. Um, yeah, and uh, John, is, John Biggs is pointing out, Tesla has availability. They have more manufacturing capability than any other manufacturer. So while Ford um, has sold out their F-150 Lightnings, um, and Rivian, um, with their pickup truck, has sold out uh, their models. They won't be able to live it and meet those manufacturing numbers for two years. Um, <clears throat> and and those numbers aren't that huge. The F-150 Lightning, I think they sold 23,000 of them. Um, and you're not going to be able to get them till the end of 23. Um, so... That, that's an advantage that Tesla has because as they're opening two new gigafactories as we speak, um, their production capabilities are going to go up dramatically. It, um, it's going to be a while before other companies are going to be able to really give them a run for it. <coughs> um, the Bluebird school bus that we talked about, the Bluebird company is actually now manufacturing electric school buses and doing very well with it. And, and these, when you think about it, all being driven in local on local roads and local towns, eliminating all those diesel emissions, uh, eliminating all those fuel costs and fuel stops, um, and the maintenance on these vehicles is roughly half of what they were on the diesel vehicles they were using. Public transportation, um, as I said, the back back. This is the rear end of a. Uh, regular com commuter bus. Um, I think this might be in Washington, D.C., actually, um, where they've got zero emission vehicles now and they work very nicely. Finally, in the, in the uh, last mile category, Mercedes is now producing the e-sprinter. And we think this is going to be uh, a, a game changer um, in last mile delivery. And finally, the Tesla Roadster in 2023, uh, we're hoping will be out 600 miles of range, zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds, uh, pretty insane. So that, that concludes my presentation. What I'm planning on doing here is I'll stop my screen share and, and we'll deal with, I, I see there's a bunch of questions and comments in there. And so we'll deal with that. So uh, let me stop my share. Okay. So, John, uh, um, this is Rick Brace again. Yes. So, I'm just uh, if you want to just maybe talk a little bit about some of the uh, um, events that the Tesla owners of Pennsylvania does, uh, how you're working with the Drive Electric Pennsylvania Coalition, and uh, I'm just uh, all about education. Uh, again, I'd like to again thank you for presenting today and, and information, but, you know, we, we plan on doing many of these uh, educational events, hopefully in person uh, this year um, as well. But, you know, I'd like everybody just to please reach out to the Clean Cities organizations, to the Tesla owners in Pennsylvania. Um, we have, uh, what do you want to talk also about the clubs that you have around um, on Pennsylvania as well? Sure. sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my uh, brief plug for the club. Um, so, uh, yeah, the Tesla Owners Club of Pennsylvania, we're an official partner with Tesla. Um, that means they, they kind of let us use the logo, but aside from that, that's about the only benefit you get from doing that. Um, but uh, the, the club has six chapters across the state. We're in Pittsburgh State College. Uh, we have the Susquehanna Valley chapter, which covers central Pennsylvania. Um, we've got King of Prussia, Lehigh Valley, and Wilkes-Barre Scranton. Um, those chapters are all in those locations. Um, one of the things, when we first formed the club, one of the things we realized when we did it, there are a lot of car clubs out there that just kind of get together um, and they do cars and coffee and some local events and everybody, and it, it becomes more of a social thing. Um, given what's going on with electric vehicles, we felt when we formed the club that 
we wanted our focus not only to be, yeah, we're into the social events. We like getting together with everybody, but we're, we have a very strong focus on owner education. Um, last year alone, we had 1,800 people go through our virtual education classes online. Uh, we hold anywhere from three to five classes a month. Um, they're open to the public. We don't charge for those classes. And it varies, usually Tesla-oriented material, but also some general stuff also. Um, so feel free, to, you can check out our website um, and our events calendars on there. Uh, our website is, uh, I'll actually put that in the chat for you guys if you didn't catch it on there, um, is tocpa.club. Pretty easy to remember. Okay, so th that being said, um, I'm noticing we've got a bunch of questions in the chat. So let me see if I can back up and, and see where I, I've uh, I left off here, because I want to make sure that everybody's questions get answered, um, if I can. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, Taki, putting in two Volvo VNRs in Cleveland in two weeks. Um, only 30 of these medium duty units in, the, in, the, in North America. Slow go on the commercial truck side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the the commercial truck side is going to be very difficult to to transform. Uh, what it really comes down to, it's almost the same as, as it was for the cars. If you want to convert um, somebody that's driving a truck to an electric vehicle, have them drive an electric truck, and they'll probably never want to get in in, in a fossil fuel vehicle again. But it's the the problem is always getting them into that. Yes, uh, David just pointed out uh, Rivian also just raised their price, um, even for people with pre-orders. Um, I think they backed off on that. I, um, but yes, um, the, the reality is right now, demand far outstrips supply for electric vehicles. As long as that equation is tipped that way, the cost of electric vehicles is going to continue to rise. Uh, yeah, e-transits are available now, um, which is which is a wonderful uh, move by Ford to get those going. Again, the last mile is really a, a great sweet spot for an electric vehicle. They don't do a lot of you know mileage. I mean, the range is more than enough to accommodate what they're doing. So yeah, that's a great opportunity. Um, but Vic asked, why is the US Postal uh, replacing most of the vehicles with ICE vehicles instead of electric? Um, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me either. And from what I understand, that's not a done deal and is being investigated as we speak. <clears throat> I think they're gonna get backed off on that. Um, thank you uh, to Key, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly for, who enjoyed the presentation. Uh, Betsy, thanks uh, with a video. Yes, the video recording for this um, will be available on the Drive Electric uh, PA site. Is that correct, Richard? Yeah, we'll put it on the on the PRCC website as well as the uh, EPA website, as well as John, with your permission, we'll put the uh, PDF slides out there as well. Absolutely. Um, and, and that, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe just talking just a little bit about the driver electric PA and how we're trying to uh, work with the uh, Tesla owners of PA. Um, sure. Uh, do you want me to talk about that or do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I can I can do that. I mean, uh, uh, again, it's uh, basically um, we're part of a, a larger group called Drive EVs USA across the uh, 14 states, across 17 clean cities organizations to basically promote um, uh, electric vehicles. And we're going across many program areas, uh, which including um, a, pl a state plan for each of those 14 states. And actually there's more states involved now, but they weren't a part of the original, um, the original program. But we are developing, each state is developing their plan to talk with uh, utilities, educate uh, uh, municipalities and state representatives and work on dealership preference programs and and worked with fleets to do that. And, and, and hockey was one of the uh, first ones to have the big area. Actually, I think there's a private showing uh, um, next week, I believe, in um, uh, in Pittsburgh for those, those vehicles. But hopefully he'll be able to uh, be able to uh, 
have those come to some of our shows and be able to show they, they are a leader in sustainability. Um, and, and, and they already have their uh, charging stations in, uh, in, the, in the pharma area. So I think, uh, uh, you please watch the Drive Electric Pennsylvania, uh, the PRCC and the EPAC websites for events that we'll be holding. We have some going on here in Western Pennsylvania um, uh, for Earth Day. Um, we actually have two in Earth Day, one in, uh, one in Murraysville and one in Mount Lebanon. And then um, we have one for the uh, Allegheny Solar Fest, which is going to be in Mill 19. I believe that's June 19th. And so we're always looking to, to be able to get out and educate folks. So please reach out to, to John, myself, uh, uh, and we'll be glad to try to arrange something in, in your area to speak with, um, with municipalities or fleets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, I would, I would also, uh, um, I want to make sure I let everybody know May 14th, there's going to be a, uh, it hasn't been posted anyway yet, but there's going to be an, um, a EV car show in Mechanicsburg at the new Tesla facility there, open to uh, all electric vehicles. Um, so keep an eye out for announcements on that. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we, we, we look forward to getting everybody there. Um, I'll go back to see if I have any uh, questions here. Um, let's see, did I miss anything? Uh, fly back to work. Yeah, video recording. Yeah, Rick, if you're okay, we'll, we'll also post that video recording on the uh, TOCPA website also. Sure, that'll be fine. Yep, okay. Um, yeah, Taki, just, yes, uh, feel free to send me an email and uh, we, we can definitely hook up. All righty. Um, okay, well, again, um, thank you all for taking time out of your day. Um, John, thank you again. It's been a pleasure and you're very, very knowledgeable on electric vehicles, much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, but, uh, you know, when we can't get the answer, we reach out to, this, uh, to the folks and hopefully we'll have some more, like Taki said, on the on the, uh, the heavy, medium heavy duty vehicles in the future. So thank you again and all have a good day.